Ah, welcome. Warm yourself by the fire. Have a seat or snuggle up in your favorite spot and let me tell you a story. But first, please, subscribe, like, and share. Battlefields are the lands of confusion, fog, and unexplainable events. They leave indelible marks, not just in the physical landscape, but an unexplainable feeling or eeriness, as if recorded in the very earth itself. On the night of August 26th, 1914, during the Battle of Mons in World War I, there was witnessed an unexplainable, and some say, a divine event still talked about and scrutinized today. Several witnesses were interviewed and made astonishingly similar statements and descriptions of angelic figures loosing their bows and filling the German foe with a piercing wall of arrows. Many have attributed this phenomena to mass hysteria, stress, or shock. While the shrieking projectiles of fragments, shrapnel, shell, and lead, sowed their seeds of death, many of the German dead were found with no distinctive or clear signs of physical injury. This could, of course, be explained by explosive shock waves, heat exhaustion, dehydration from prolonged exertion, use of gas, or many other phenomena particular to a battlefield. However, there is no actual explanation for the many witnesses who were separated by distance in the battle, descriptions of the angelic figures, or as many German prisoners stated and described, the reinforcements coming from behind. The most curious statements that I found were from the German prisoners, the Battle of Mons was essentially a retreating battle fought by the British expeditionary force to a final defensive line. There were no reinforcements. The line behind them was empty. The following is an authored story based on the account of this event. The Bowman by Arthur Mackin it was during the retreat of the 80,000 and the authority of the censorship is sufficient excuse for not being more explicit. But it was on the most awful day of that awful time, on the day when ruin and disaster came so near that our shadow fell over London far away, and without any certain news, the hearts of men failed within them and grew faint, as if the agony of the army in the battlefield had entered into their souls. On this dreadful day, when 300,000 men in arms with all their artillery swelled like a flood against the English company, there was one point above all other points in our battle line that was, for a time, in awful danger, not merely of defeat, but of utter annihilation. With the permission of the censorship and of the military expert, this corner, perhaps, may be described as a salient and if this angle were crushed and broken, then the English forces as a whole would be shattered. The Allied left would be turned, and defeat would inevitably follow. All the morning the German guns had thundered and shrieked against this corner, and against the thousand or so of its men who held it. The men joked at the shells, and found funny names for them and had bets about them, and greeted them with scraps of music hall songs. But the shells came on, and burst, and tore the good Englishman limb from limb, and tore brother from brother. And as the heat of the day increased, so did the fury of the terrific cannonade. There was no help, it seemed. The English artillery was good, but there was not hardly enough of it, and it was being steadily battered into scrap iron. There comes a moment in a storm at sea when people say to one another, It is at its worst. It can blow no harder. And then there's a blast ten times more fierce than any before it. So it was in these British trenches. There were no stouter hearts in the whole world than the hearts of these men. 
But even they were appalled as the seven times heated hell as the German cannonade fell upon them and overwhelmed them and destroyed them. And at this very moment, they saw from their trenches that a tremendous host was moving against their line. Five hundred of the thousand remained, and as far as they could see, the German infantry was pressing on against them. Column upon column, a gray world of men, ten thousand of them as it appeared afterwards. There was no hope at all. They shook their hands, some of them. One man improvised a new version of the battle song, Goodbye, Goodbye to Tipperary, ending with, And we shan't get there. And they all went on firing steadily. The officer pointed out that such an opportunity for high-class fancy shooting might never occur again. The Tipperary humorist asked, What price, Sydney Street? And the few machine guns did their best, but everybody knew it was of no use. The dead and gray bodies lay in companies and battalions as others came on and on, and they swarmed and stirred and advanced from beyond. World without end, amen, said one of the British soldiers with some irrelevance as he took aim and fired. And then he remembered he says he cannot think why or wherefore. A queer vegetarian restaurant in London where he had once or twice eaten eccentric dishes of cutlets made of lentils and nuts that pretended to be steak. On all the plates in this restaurant there was printed a figure of St. George in blue with the motto, Adsit Anglis Sanctus Georgius. May St. George be a present help to the English. This soldier happened to know Latin and other useless things, and now, as he fired at men in the gray advancing mass, three hundred yards away, he uttered the pious vegetarian motto. He went on firing to the end, and, at last, Bill on his right hand had to clout him cheerfully over the head to make him stop, pointing out as he did so that the king's ammunition cost money, and was not likely to be wasted in drilling funny patterns into dead Germans. For as the Latin scholar uttered his invocation, he felt something between a shudder and an electric shock pass through his body. The roar of the battle died down in his ears to a gentle murmur. Instead of it, he says he heard a great voice and a shout, louder than a thunder peal, crying, Hurrah! 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 His heart grew hot as a burning coal, and then it grew cold as ice within him, as it seemed to him that a tumult of voices answered to his summons. He heard, or seemed to hear, thousands shouting, St. George! St. George! And as the soldier heard these voices, he saw before him, beyond the trench, a long line of shapes with a shining about them. They were like men who drew the bow, and, with another shout, their cloud of arrows flew, singing and tingling through the air toward the German hosts. The other men in the trench were firing all the while. They had no hope, but they aimed just as if they had been shooting at Bisley. Suddenly, one of them lifted up his voice in the plainest English. "'God help us!' he bellowed to the next man. But we're blooming marvels. Look at those gray. Gentlemen, look at them. Do you see them? They're going down in dozens. No, the hundreds. It's thousands, it is. Look. Look, there's a regiment gone while I'm talking to you. Shut it, the other soldier bellowed, taking aim. What are you gassing about? But he gulped with astonishment even as he spoke, for indeed... The gray men were falling by the thousands. The English could hear the guttural screams of the German officers, the crackle of their revolvers as they shot the reluctant, and still, line after line, crashed to the earth. All the while, the Latin-bred soldier heard the cry, Harrow! Harrow! Monsignor! Dear Saint! Quick to our aid! 
St. George, help us! The singing arrows fled so swiftly and thick that they darkened the air the heathen horde melted from before them. More machine guns, Bill yelled to Tom. I don't hear them, Tom yelled back. But thank God anyway, they've got it in the neck. In fact, there were 10,000 dead German soldiers left before that salient of the English army, and consequently, there was no defeat. In Germany, a country ruled by scientific principles, the great general staff decided that the contemptible English must have employed shells containing an unknown gas of a poisonous nature, as no wounds were discernible on the bodies of the dead German soldiers. But the man who knew what vegetarian dishes tasted like when they called themselves steak knew also that St. George had brought his Agincourt bowmen to help the English. The end.